The last time a ministry or a government department has used public policy to discriminate and disenfranchise and oppress uh, people groups in this country was during apartheid. 31 years later, we see the same crusade, the same use of apartheid tactics, the same use of government departments to discriminate, disenfranchise and harass people. And you see the same um, fleeing of a minority group into exile because they aren't afforded the equal rights and the, and the equal protection our, our founding fathers fought for. You're not welcome as a gay person in Namibia and you feel it. Everyone goes out of their way to make you feel like there's something wrong with you. We're supposedly to be all equal, yet we're not. Um, just because we're gay. I never felt like I could be who I am in Namibia without being discriminated against or judged. And uh, so that's how I'm you know, more or less self-imposed um, exile abroad. You're never just Mike, you're always like gay Mike or you're always someone's gay son or someone's gay friend or the gay nephew. And. Um, living here in the UK, what, one of the things I, I cherish the most is that my sexuality, not that it's irrelevant, but it's not, you know, in the top three or top five things that define me as a person. And that, I think, is a stage that Namibia has not reached yet. And that is something that I personally find uncomfortable and something that I wouldn't want to live with every day. I knew I would be an outsider pretty much all my life. I knew that I wouldn't have rights. I could be discriminated against, whether it's in the workplace or anywhere else. You would have thought maybe that lessons have been learned out of the past, but they've not been learned clearly, because some people are still being treated like they are the underdogs. And it's something that should stop. It has to stop. Definitely one of the reasons why I've not been back into that country since 2002. We always walk with the worry of somebody saying something, somebody attacking you or ridiculing you on the street just for being different. I do sometimes feel guilty. I think, you know, I'm one of the lucky ones, one of the ones who, who were able to leave and were able to escape. But I do feel bad for people who remain in Namibia and have to face these challenges every day and have to face this discrimination and have to face this lack of basic human right. I do miss my family, I miss my friends I have there, I miss that I can't just, you know, pop over for a braai over the weekend and I miss those connections, but I don't think I could ever live in Namibia again. For all the tea in China, I will not move back to Namibia. It's not a country that I, I can call home. I knew I was gay when I was about 12, 13. I realised that I think the penny dropped with me, that I was different, and of course when you do talk to people about it very much shunned in a lot of ways and then religion comes into it and religion is like in the school you know like oh there's something wrong it's forbidden it's this it's that it's everything basically under the sun but at such a young age it is a very difficult thing to um to deal with because if you don't have the right people that you can talk to um you're very much alone and at that time, I was very much alone. I told everyone, my friends at school, pretty much lost every single friend um, and stopped being invited to, uh, to anything and it's not a nice thing to go through. The amount of mental strain that takes on somebody is unimaginable. Pretending to be somebody else in such an important part of your life is really, really, really draining. You, you, you feel like you're lying to everybody. It was only when I um, moved to South Africa to go to university there that um, through speaking to friends there and um, people coming out to me that I realised I was gay. So after my studies, I decided to move abroad just because I felt that there was a safe space where I could become myself. I remember always feeling different. I always felt like 
I don't know, I was a, I was a cat living amongst dogs. There was one gay person that I knew of who was the guy who worked in the stationery shop and um, people laughed at him and, and that's what, what gay people were in Namibia when I was growing up. They, they were a joke, they were something to, to ridicule. The situation for LGBT people in Namibia, I remember feeling just something was wrong with me. Who I was was not okay and something really, really sad I think is that that is what it's still like for young people in Namibia today that you have to grow up and you have to experience that judgment as a young person which is a confusing enough time for, for anyone anyway. Um, and that is something that I wish, I, I hope for I hope for a change in Namibia that that young people don't have to experience that anymore because because they shouldn't have to. Over the past year, the world has witnessed a rise in social justice protests. Namibia is no exception. Namibia's long history of a don't ask, don't tell policy has allowed LGBTQ persons to live in relative peace still. Over the years, many persons have been subjected to police brutality, discrimination at health facilities, and other unequal treatment. I, I cannot, I cannot recount the many times or mention the many times I've been harassed or attacked physically. Thirty-one years later, still we have to fight for the right to belong, the right to a family, the right to be free, to be gay, to be lesbian in this country. Thirty-one years later, post independence. The arrival of twins Paula and Maya in March this year, born via surrogacy to Namibian Philip Lul and his husband Julemo, and government's decision to ban the babies from returning home, is a stark reminder of Namibia's apartheid past and marks the start of a new liberation struggle. What do we want? Equality! What do we want now? now? Today, we are sending a message as LGBTQ people and as allies that we belong. We belong in Namibia! Not too long ago, we were fighting that very same thing, just based on colour. Now it's being done based on sexuality. I'm, I'm tired of the fighting, I'm tired of the debating, because it's quite evident that this is political homophobia, this is patriarchy at its best. LGBTQ rights are the civil rights issue of our time. And both the courts, the executive, and the legislature are blessing an opportunity here to uphold human rights. Namibian taxpayers are funding this crusade of injustice against their fellow citizens. More than six active court cases in this year alone against the Ministry of Home Affairs that is LGBTQ related. I think this is the time for Namibia to really kind of wake up and get a grip and just, just basically give us the rights that we should have. We just want the same rights as everybody else. I think there's a lack of understanding also in Namibian society about what it means to be gay, who we are, what we do. I know Guillermo and Phil and them and it's, it's, it's just not right that we are still standing here and have to beg and plead for courts and our governing bodies to be able to understand that what they're doing is wrong. The case of Philip is quite close to my heart. I went to school with Philip. He was actually my matric farewell date. And although we both weren't out at that stage, and I think that was just because of the nature in Namibia, you can't you couldn't just come out, it wasn't really a thing. There was a group of us who all kind of felt connected, I think, and we all realized we were different. So it's heartbreaking seeing, um, seeing him struggle and being denied his rights as a father. And there's no, and nobody else who adopts a child in South Africa or if you have a donor egg and no, none of those parents get asked for DNA proof that they're parents. It's an invasion of privacy in, in a certain way. This identity of statelessness has only been seen during war times and like I said during apartheid too. The Libyans are watching, the world is watching, and our, our identity and values as a country was founded out of the idea and promise of equality for all are at stake here. I think what's happening to this family is heartbreaking. It's so hard to understand 
how the courts could have made this decision and what should be the easiest thing that a child or, or children are together with their parents is being prevented here and this family is being denied this basic right that most people wouldn't think twice about and just take for granted. My son is mixed heritage, so taking him to Namibia, a concern was that he might experience racism, which um, obviously I did not want him exposed to at all. But an even bigger concern was him experiencing judgment and homophobia, because his reality is that his family is him, and he's got two mummies, and he's got a daddy, and he's got a stepdaddy. I was genuinely concerned whether he would be in any situations where he would experience judgment and people giving him the idea that there's something wrong with his family and something wrong with who he is and that is not something like any parent I would want my child to experience. Gay parents have to fight so much harder to be able to have kids. These kids are so loved and so well looked after. It's not just an accident. You can't just by accident get pregnant. And then denying somebody that, that right, that's, that's heartbreaking. I think we have to be also honest to ourselves that, you know, we, you know, now that, um, that we have a family and that we have, you know, these little ones that haven't even met each other, um, we, you know, there is a limit to how long we can, you know, fight and essentially how long we can be apart. So, um, yeah, it's, I think we, we're currently just, you know, considering all the various options and all the, the scenarios and all the implications of the various scenarios because it is, you know, becoming more and more complex every day. Um, but... You know, one of the saddest implications, of course, would be to, you know, if you would have to, you know, leave the country and essentially go into exile. I don't take the rights for granted that I have here in the UK. I think they, they have been fought for and they have been earned, but I do think they are basic rights that every person in every country in the world should have. How can young kids or straight people or straight men um, have have that public awareness if if we are given the state recognition if we are pushed into the shadows if we are pushed to live on the margins of society the government won't let itself be bullied in any way or form they have set their minds on what they think is their their their, their choice of uh, how to treat us so i think what the equal rights movement is doing now is creating visibility and that's a key. It's the unknown that we are afraid of. As frustrating and as heartbreaking as this case is with Philip and his family, it's a fantastic moment of uproar. If not now, when will we demand change? How? How is this allowed? How many people have committed suicide because of this? We should know better. We should honestly just know better you know not too long ago it was independence day and what was what was that freedom about what was that equality equality for whom